What's going on guys? It is Friday and we are gonna do some more math. And today, what we're gonna focus on is deriving the volume of a sphere. So I'm sure everyone remembers learning uh, in geometry class back in the day that the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. But I don't know about you, but I never really understood why. That doesn't seem intuitive at all. So we're gonna use a little bit of calculus to show why this is the case. So we're going to consider a sphere to be a sort of stack of circular cross sections. So if you picture like a ball, uh, imagine that you were to just keep slicing it into really, really thin pieces. They would all look like kind of flat, almost two dimensional circles, little disks that are getting a, that are obtaining a smaller and smaller radius as you get up towards the top. And then by the time you reach the top, it's essentially like an infinitesimally small little circle until there's virtually nothing. You get to the edge of the sphere. So we're gonna do this vertically. It would work the same way if we were to integrate horizontally because a sphere is symmetrical. It's the same distance in every direction. Uh, so let's get started. I'm gonna start by just calling our limits of integration negative r and r, assuming that we're centered at the origin. So this will be negative r and we're going up to r. Now, one common mistake that I see a lot of the students that I work with in calculus make is they focus just on this initial cross section that I've drawn at the very center. And they'll say, oh, okay, well, this radius here is just x. So great, this is nice and easy. I'm just gonna integrate from negative r to r. And the area of that particular cross section, the area of a circle is pi r squared. If I call that radius x, the area of that cross section would just be pi x squared. So I would just be integrating pi x squared dx. But that's wrong. And the reason why that's wrong is because you're assuming that the radius of the circle of each cross section is staying constant as x. And that definitely doesn't have to be true. So we have to adjust this a tiny little bit. So let's think. Now, if I were to go up to another generic cross section, like let's say this up here, the question I wanna ask myself is, what is the relationship between how the radii are changing? And they're changing by following this path. Well, if I were to lay a sphere on, if I were to project it onto the two-dimensional xy plane, it would just look like a circle. And this curve is just a portion of a circle. If we assume the radius is r, then this can actually be modeled by the equation of a circle graph in the coordinate plane. This would be x squared plus y squared equals r squared. If I solve for the radius, that just means the radius is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Now, because a sphere is completely symmetrical, that means x and y generally are gonna be the same distance. So I could just replace either x or y with the other variable. So that would give us the square root of x squared plus x squared. And so r would be the square root of 2x squared. And this is going to define our radius. So we're integrating from negative r to r pi times the square root of 2x squared squared, because the area of each cross section is still pi r squared dx. And that is just going to be equal to the integral from negative r to r of 2 pi x squared dx. Because square root and the square just cancel each other out. And now we can integrate. So because it's with respect to x, we're just going to use the power rule of integration. So this will become... 2 pi x cubed over 3 integrated from negative r to r. And that's just going to be equal to 2 thirds pi times r cubed minus negative r cubed. 
Well, that just becomes 2 thirds pi times 2r cubed. And unsurprisingly, this just gives us 4 thirds pi r cubed as the volume of a sphere. So it's not just randomly, uh, you know, kind of made up uh, mathematical, you know, mystical magic. It's, it comes from a reasonable place. And we can see here that the derivation is not too bad. There are a lot of different ways to derive this. We could also derive this by mapping this into a three-dimensional coordinate plane. But I think that this is a nice intuitive way to demonstrate probably the initial way that you would be exposed to deriving the volume of three-dimensional shapes in a typical Calculus II course. I hope that this was helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to indicate them in the comments. Uh, I'm always looking for kind of new ideas for what to include in my videos. So if you ever have any suggestions, or maybe there's something uh, that you're covering in your summer course at the moment, or when school starts up again, maybe you'll kind of hit a topic that is sort of throwing you for a loop. And I would love to dive into it and discuss it and just help make the world a more mathematically literate place. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And I will see you guys soon.